Welcome to Trinity Rep Radio Theater. I'm Kurt Columbus. And I'm Janice Duclos. And today's program celebrates our fifth anniversary with WRNI. Our program began in 2006 with a program of Chekhov stories. And since then, we have produced more than 30 programs wow. featuring poetry, fiction, narratives, and excerpts from novels from authors ranging from Edgar Allan Poe to Yumpa Lahiri. You know, longtime listeners of the show know that this show embraces storytelling in its purest form, from writers' imaginations through our actors' craft, right to our listeners. Later in today's program, our centerpiece story, we're going to reprise one of our favorites, Robert Penn Warren's A Christian Education. That was first broadcast in September 2007. And Janice, will you tell us about some of our shorter pieces today? Sure. We will begin with a new reading of another favorite, Wants by Grace Paley, which we first read on the program in 2009. And we will share some pieces from the Sun Magazine section called Reader's Right. Now, all of these shorter pieces share themes with a Christian education. Life offers us moments when we can connect with others, real turning points for us and others, if only we seize the opportunity. Hmm. Good. Why don't we start with Wants? Um, It's a Grace Paley story, and um, our listeners know that Grace Paley is one of our favorite writers. And over the years, we've done conversations with my father and the loudest voice. She is best known for her short stories, but Mm -hmm. she was also a poet and a peace activist. And she passed away in 2007. In Wants, the narrator encounters her ex-husband of 27 years. Mm. We will hear now Grace Paley's Wants on Trinity Rep Radio Theater. I saw my ex-husband in the street. I was sitting on the steps of the new library. Hello, my life, I said. We had once been married for 27 years, so I felt justified. He said, What? What life? No life of mine. I said, Okay. I don't argue when there's real disagreement. I got up and went into the library to see how much I owed them. The librarian said, $32 even, and you've owed it for 18 years. I didn't deny anything, because I don't understand how time passes. I have had those books. I have often thought of them. The library is only two blocks away. My ex-husband followed me to the book's return desk. He interrupted the librarian, who had more to tell. In many ways, as I look back... I attribute the dissolution of our marriage to the fact that you never invited the Bertrams to dinner. That's possible. But really, if you remember, first, my father was sick that Friday. Then the children were born. Then I had those Tuesday night meetings. Then the war began. Then we didn't seem to know them anymore. But you're right. I should have had them to dinner. I gave the librarian a check for $32. Immediately, she trusted me, put my past behind her, wiped the record clean, which is just what most other municipal and or state bureaucracies will not do. And then I checked out the two Edith Wharton books I had just returned because I'd read them so long ago, and they are more apropos now than ever. They were... The House of Mirth and The Children, which is about how life in the United States in New York changed in 27 years, 50 years ago. My ex-husband said, A nice thing I do remember is breakfast. (laughs) I was surprised. All we ever had was coffee. Then I remembered there was a hole in the back of the kitchen closet which opened into the apartment next door. There, they always ate sugar-cured smoked bacon. It gave us a very grand feeling about breakfast, but we never got stuffed and sluggish. I said, That was when we were poor. When were we ever rich? Oh, as time went on, as our responsibilities increased, we didn't go in need. You took adequate financial care. The children went to camp four weeks a year and in decent ponchos with sleeping bags and boots, just like everyone else. They looked very nice. Our place was warm in winter, and we had nice red pillows and things. I wanted a sailboat, but you 
didn't want anything. Mm, don't be bitter. It's never too late. No, no, no. I may get a sailboat. A as a matter of fact, I have money down on an 18-foot two-rigger. I'm doing well this year and can look forward to better. But as for you, it's too late. You'll always want nothing. He had had a habit throughout the 27 years of making a narrow remark which, like a plumber's snake, would work its way through the ear, down the throat, halfway to my heart. He would then disappear, leaving me choking with equipment. What I mean is, I sat down on the library steps and he went away. I looked through the house of mirth, but lost interest. I felt extremely accused. Now, it's true, I'm short of requests and absolute requirements, but I do want something. I want, for instance, to be a different person. I want to be the woman who brings these two books back in two weeks. I want to be the effective citizen who changes the school system and addresses the Board of Estimate on the troubles of this dear urban center. I had promised my children to end the war before they grew up. I wanted to have been married forever to one person. My ex-husband or my present one either has enough character for a whole life which, as it turns out, is really not such a long time. You couldn't exhaust either man's qualities or get under the rock of his reasons in one short life. Just this morning, I looked out the window to watch the street for a while and saw that the little sycamores the city had dreamily planted a couple of years before the kids were born had come that day to the prime of their lives. Well, I decided to bring those two books back to the library, which proves that when a person or an event comes along to jolt or appraise me, I can take some appropriate action, although I am better known for my hospitable remarks. This is Trinity Rep Radio Theater, and we've just been reading Grace Paley's Wants. I love that story, Janice. <laughs> I do too. I love the I love her characters. Oh. They're both so flawed, and yet you understand them so well. Oh my gosh! Well, I mean, and she's like she's a little bit like Camus the Stranger in the sense that she's so unable to move forward, and yet her self description and her self understanding is not like that at all. She thinks yeah, she's she, really motivated. She's out there, yeah, right? Yeah, and she seems to be able to appraise herself pretty accurately and, you know, doesn't have to do it in a flattering way. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's I just the 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 use of language in this story um and you can hear Grace Paley's voice. She's so great at these turns of phrase like, you know, it, the 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 statement um being like the plumber's snake. Oh my gosh. Right? What a great description. And leaving behind equipment. You can feel the pain of that. <laughs> and I, I love the exchange. I love the exchange between her and her ex-husband where he says, no, 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 no. I'm going to get the sailboat. Yeah. I'm going to get it. And it just it just sounds very real to me. And, you know, it's sad about the, the pain that remains from that relationship. Yeah. Yeah. Except for breakfast. Except for breakfast. <laughs> and the nice red pillows. It's just <laughs> things like that. They have They have this very complicated interesting relationship and it was really fun to we've never played man and wife on this show no, so we haven't and so it's a it's nice to this do that maybe our only opportunity <laughs> well so here we are unless you want to get down on one knee yeah. right now uh, well it just, uh, you wouldn't be able to see it this is radio <laughs> Why don't we hear a couple of our readers write pieces now? All right. Um, our listeners will, will recall that these contributors are not professional writers, although you would think so. <laughs> From <laughs> Some of these pieces are amazing. Yeah. Uh, their narratives offer frank accounts of real lives um, inspired by topics which are proposed by the magazine's editors. Janice will read the first piece, and I'll read our second. My older brother loved Monopoly. On summer days, when it was too hot to be outside, he'd beg me to play. Sometimes I would give in because I didn't have anything better to do, 
or because I felt sorry for him. He didn't have many friends. At first, I'd get caught up in the game, trying to buy at least a few good properties and not get stuck with just the purple ones. But it wouldn't last. There weren't many things my brother was good at, but he was good at Monopoly. He always ended up with Boardwalk and Park Place, where he would put not one, but several hotels. At that point, I would quit. Furious, he would insist I keep playing, but I saw no point if I was going to lose. I see now that by refusing to continue, I took away his chance at victory. Now in his fifties, my brother hasn't won much in life. He's never had a relationship that lasted more than a few years and hasn't worked in a decade letting our mother support him. Maybe he would have believed in him, himself more if I'd let him experience the joy of winning. Mary Dalton Soon after the Berlin Wall fell, I traveled to Eastern Europe to see for myself what had become of the place. I had certain expectations from my reading. Endemic poverty, grim winters, terrible wars, genocide, brutal occupations, and political repression. But what I hadn't expected was the singing. People sang everywhere, it seemed. They sang fearlessly, unashamedly, needing no encouragement, only the barest excuse or no excuse at all. Drinkers in a pub would break into spontaneous, full-throated song. School children sang on the bus. Even the most destitute bums, degraded by a lifetime of alcoholism, cradled their bottles of vodka and crooned to themselves. This could not have been more different from the culture in which I'd grown up. In our suburb in upstate New York, casual, untrained singing was unheard of. No one hummed while doing the dishes or homework. No one sang in the shower or bathtub. I walked to school every day and rode a two-mile paper route for three years, and not once did I hear singing. When people drank, they got mean, or lacrimose, or first one, then the other. The Catholic school I attended once tried to hire a music teacher, but she lost her temper when my fellow sixth graders and I refused to sing, ironically enough, Simon and Garfunkel's The Sound of Silence. There was one exception, my sister. Siblings in a large family tend to have one outcast, and she was ours, the butt of all of our jokes, the recipient of the cruelest nicknames, the target of our unconcealed scorn and derision. She was also the most sensitive, the most unable to hide her feelings. That singing came naturally to her was in our eyes a sign that she was a hopeless weirdo. She only ever sang behind the closed door of her room, but she did so exuberantly, gloriously, without restraint and with enormous soul. And as if following the example displayed on every wall of our house in portraits of the bleeding Jesus, we crucified her for it. In later years, we realized our mistake and tried to encourage her. Too late. The damage had been done. The rest of us have all left our dump of a hometown, but she still lives there, middle-aged, obese, and alone. Anonymous. This is Trinity Rep Radio Theater. I'm Janice Duclos with Kurt Columbus, and we have been reading selections from the Sun Magazine's Reader's Rights section. Those are just so lovely and sad. <laughs> <laughs> they are sad. I, I think it's interesting the way these people have actually reflected on what they've done. Mm -hmm. I don't know if, if, you know, it really had these devastating effects on these people, but it might have been a cumulative thing, maybe. Yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting because um, what I love about both of these pieces and about the Christian education piece that we're going to hear later um, is that, that it's the tiny... Uh, tiny um, infractions, uh, um, hurts, wants, needs, little things 
have um, cumulative effect. Yeah. And you don't, you're in the middle of it and you don't think that telling your sister she's an idiot for singing or not letting your brother win at Monopoly is going to have an effect, but that these, re- these uh, readers, right, people are able to see the effect is kind of amazing. Yeah, and I, and I think that everyone can identify with little cruelties. Yeah. I think we're all guilty of them yeah. at one yeah, time yeah. or another, you know, and it may not be malicious, but, you know, there are things that you do, especially as a kid, my oh. God, <laughs> you know, that yeah. make you wince when you think about it when you're an adult. Yeah. But uh, I, I, I think it, it's interesting in that story about um, the sister who sang, um, even listening about the singing in Eastern Europe. And, right. and you spent some time there, Kurt. What, what, do, what do you think of that in this story? <laughs> well, I, I mean, I, I said to you in rehearsal the other day that that's actually really, really true, that people there do sing unrestrainedly. And it's partially because it's a culture where, um, well, of course, I spent time there 20 years ago, Janice. So um, uh, it was a culture that didn't have recorded music and iPod music and all of that other stuff as accessible. Um, And so uh, you you would bring the music into existence with your own voice instead of waiting for the recorded music to bring it into existence. Well, that's really interesting because that that makes the sister even more special because in, in today's right. day and age, and, and I don't think that this story took place more than, you know... 20 years ago, yeah, 25. Yeah, more than 20 years ago. Um, you know, and, and even then, you know, we had records. Right. We had, we had tapes, and people don't tend to sing here, but she was brave enough that she created her own music right. to soothe herself. Yeah, and that and that makes the cruelty even greater. <laughs> yeah, when when putting putting it to rest in in her making her stop, I think is uh, is even a greater cruelty that they inflicted on her. It's extraordinary. Um, well, we're going to take a short break now, and then when we come back, we will hear our centerpiece story: a Christian education. This is Trinity Rep Radio Theater. Stay with us. You're listening to Trinity Rep Radio Theater on WRNI, Rhode Island's own NPR news station. To listen to this episode or previous episodes, you can subscribe to the Trinity Rep Radio Theater podcast by visiting our website at WRNI.org. back with Trinity Rep Radio Theater. I'm Kirk Columbus, and with me in the studio is Janice Duclos. The stories in today's program look at the lasting effects of our choices and circumstances that affect us in our lives. In this part of our program, we're going to listen to Robert Penn Warren's story, A Christian Education. We know Robert Penn Warren primarily as the author of All the King's Men, the Pulitzer Prize winning novel adapted and performed twice at Trinity Rep. His short stories are stunning, Mm -hmm. and this is one of our favorites. This is a 2007 performance featuring Stephen Thorne, Fred Sullivan Jr., and the two of us. Yes. And it looks back at pivotal moments in one man's childhood. Let's listen to A Christian Education by Robert Penn Warren on Trinity Rep Radio Theater. Mr. Jim Nabb, who was a successful farmer and highly respected in our section, had about 350 acres of first-rate land, a couple of big red barns, a big house painted red with the same kind of paint used on the barns, a big fat wife, and a boy who wasn't right bright. He was a good man, everybody used to say, and from all reports, I reckon he was... He was superintendent of the Sunday school at the Methodist Church in town, and I can recollect the time when I was a boy and used to go to church and recollect him there every Sunday up in front leading the singing or making the announcements. He didn't have either the bullying kind of voice or the tearful kind of voice like most people have who get up and talk a lot in public to show off, especially in church. But when he talked or made his announcements, everybody listened close, even if his voice wasn't very strong because he was so well-respected in the community. Mr. Nabb never smiled, that is to speak of, but he always had a sort of sad look on his face. He didn't have a sour look, just sad and resigned, like he was carrying his cross, as the saying goes. Looking back now, I reckon he had that sad look on account of his boy not being very bright. 
which must be enough to make a man sad, especially when you've got a good piece of land and a house like his and money in the bank, but nobody to leave it all to when you pass on to the better world. I guess he wanted another child mighty bad, somebody who could take up where he left off, so to speak, and protect the one who wasn't very bright. I can remember the ladies talking about how Mrs. Nab just couldn't get in a family way no matter what she tried. And her health wasn't too good anyway, like it frequently isn't with those big fat women who ail all the time and are inclined to cry if you look at them. Anyway, it took Mr. Nab eleven more years before he got any results and there was another baby, which was a boy, too. Mrs. Nab told the ladies it was just an answer to prayer. But when the second baby came, Mr. Nab didn't lose that sad look like you might think, even if now he did have what he'd been praying for for such a long time. His face had probably just grown that way by that time. Or maybe he wasn't sure the new baby would turn out to be right bright either, for you can't tell when they're little, and he didn't want to be counting his chickens before they hatched. And by the time the new one, Alec Nab, had got any size on him, and you could tell he had good sense, something else happened to make Mr. Nab look sad again. Everybody always felt sorry for Mr. Nab because he was a good man and tried to practice what he preached. A Christian education, he said, was the greatest thing in the world. And he tried to give his boy, the one who wasn't right bright, a good raisin. And it must be pretty hard to try to give a nitwit a good Christian education when they look at you that way and are liable to slobber. When they look at you that way, you must feel like you are just pouring something valuable down the drain. Silas Nab wasn't really an idiot. He just wasn't right bright. He was in the same Sunday school class I was in and got promoted when the time came, even if he couldn't answer questions. He could say the golden text sometimes, though, if he got a little prompting from his mother, who taught the class. When he got it all out, she used to look mighty pleased, and when he didn't and began to stare off at something else, the tears would start running down her cheeks. But he didn't get promoted in school after the first year or two, and after he was in the second grade for about three years, his father took him out of school, which is likely the only advantage of being a nitwit. But Silas learned one thing his people tried to teach him about being a good Christian. Mrs. Nab used to try to teach us boys in Sunday school about a soft answer turning away wrath and about turning the other cheek when somebody was mean to you and about the meek inheriting in the earth. Silas learned better than anybody about turning the other cheek. The boys used to pester him a little bit because they knew he wouldn't do anything about it or fight back. We never hit him or are real mean to him. We just push him off the sidewalk out in front of the church when we're waiting for Sunday school to start. Or maybe rub our knucks in his head a little. It don't hurt, but it sure makes you mad. <laughs> it's called the Dutch shampoo. <laughs> we used to get to Sunday school early because the only fun in going was to horse around outside before things got started. We stand around out there in front of wear good clothes. Some Somebody sneaks up to pull somebody else's tie. Or mess somebody's hair up. Then somebody sees the nabs come oh. driving up the street. Everybody straight now. Oh. <laughs> and look, look innocent. Mr. Nab would be sitting up in front holding the reins with Mrs. Nab by his side. Silas would be on the back seat leaning against the back and look behind at the dust they raised. Mrs. Nab would say good morning to all of us, calling us by our names, and then she would say to Silas, Silas, don't you want to play with the boys? Then she would leave him out there. The boys weren't really mean to Silas. They just pestered him. We'd push him off the sidewalk. Make him step in the deep dust, get his shoes full of dust. Oh, full of mud if it's muddy. <laughs> he would just say, don't, and come back up on the sidewalk. And somebody push him off again. <laughs> Even the little kids would push him. And I remember kids not more than four or five years old going up to push Silas when he was 10 or 12 and big for his age. <laughs> that was the funniest. And then somebody would say, Silas, why don't you lamb somebody for pushing you? I wouldn't let nobody push me like that. And maybe he would say, God says not to fight. That is, if he said anything. And somebody would say, Did God say that? You know, I didn't hear him say nothing, or maybe I just misunderstood him. <laughs> <laughs> but nobody ever got a rise out of Silas, except maybe to make him cry. If he cried, everybody would get afraid he would tell, and they'd wipe his nose and comfort him to make him stop. I used to get plain disgusted sometimes, and after I got any size on me, I never pushed him myself, because I got so I didn't approve of it somehow. But... 
<laughs> it was funny when the real little kids pushed him. But sometimes I used to wish Silas would knock hell out of somebody. There used to be a big Sunday school picnic every summer. All the women would fix up stuff to eat, fried chicken and boiled ham and deviled eggs and beaten biscuits and lemon pie and chess pie and salt rising bread and tea and fruit jars. That summer, Silas was about 13 or 14 years old, Mr. Nab asked them to have the picnic out at his place, which for a matter of fact was a right good place for a picnic. There was a big pond, a sort of lake on his place, one with nice trees and some thickets you could hide in. And there was a good rowboat people used for fishing, though Mr. Nab himself didn't fish any. He just kept the boat there for people who liked to fish, which was one of the things that made Mr. Nab so highly respected in the community. We had the picnic out there under the trees. It was July and hot, but it was cool in the shade with a nice breeze. After the ladies got everything fixed out nice on the tables, we all came up and stood around while Mr. Nab returned thanks for the blessings God had bestowed upon us. Then we got paper plates and paper napkins. And the ladies give us helpings of everything. We eat all we can hold. But there was always a lot left over because no lady likes to have people think she's stingy. Mr. Nab always suggested they ought to give what was left to the poor, which they did. We ate all we could, and then we lay around a little, letting it settle. But it don't take long for food to settle on a kid's stomach, so pretty soon we got to horsing around and playing games, playing high spy in the thickets and behind the trees. Then somebody, Joe Sykes, I believe it was, said to me, Let's go out in that boat. So some of us pushed the boat out and got in. Then... Silas Nab came down and wanted to go too. Mrs. Nab didn't want him to go, but Mr. Nab came down and said it would do Silas good to go and asked us very politely, did we mind? It being Mr. Nab's boat, what could we say? I guess it's sure. all right. Sure. Yeah. We rowed around out there in the pond some, but rowing around in a pond is never as much fun as you think it is before you start, unless you're fishing or something. And the sun was bearing down, too. The trouble was there just wasn't anything to do sitting out there in a boat in the sun. So the boys got to telling Silas dirty jokes like they did sometimes. Or teaching him dirty words. We ask him dirty questions, and no matter what he says, whether he says yes or no or what, it sure it sounds, sounds funny. funny. It sounds <laughs> funny coming from a nitwit that way. Then the smallest boy in the boat, Ben Tupper, who was about nine years old maybe, got to pestering Silas. He was sitting behind Silas in the boat and... I pull a short hair on the back of Silas's neck a little or take his short tail out from behind. We told him to stop. It just makes him worse. All the time we were drifting around out there in the hot sun, little Ben Tupper wouldn't stop. So one of the bigger boys said... Ben, I'm going to slap your teeth down your throat if you don't stop. But after a minute, he kept right on. He would pull out Silas's shirt tail and say... Silas, what does God say? But Silas never said anything the whole time. I guess it was the sun bearing down and Silas being so crowded up with people in the boat that made him do it. And that boat was too full anyway. But Ben Tupper kept on pestering him. Silas, what does God say? All of a sudden, I noticed Silas had a little pocket knife in his hand, which his father didn't have any better sense than to give him one Christmas. So I yelled, Ben! But it didn't do any good. For just that second, Ben was jerking at the short hair on the back of Silas's neck again, and Silas swung round with that knife open to make a pass at Ben. One of the big boys up front near Silas made a grab for his arm and got stabbed in the hand. Damn you. And little Ben Tupper, just scared to death, jumped up and fell back to get out of the way. Mrs. Knapp, way back on the shore, must have seen something was up, because I can remember hearing her voice coming across the water. Silas! Silas! Maybe she caught the sunshine on that knife. But one of the other boys made a grab for Silas and maybe hit him accidentally, a something. Or maybe it was because little Ben started the boat to rockin' so bad, but all of a sudden Silas hit the water and splashed everybody in the boat ringin' wet. <gasps> you know how it is when somebody dives out of a boat. It sends the boat away a piece, too. Well, Silas fell out of the boat the same way, and by the time we stopped the boat rockin', we were more than 15 feet away. Silas came back up to the top of the water and began to yell and splash, and I saw that he couldn't swim. 
I was a pretty good swimmer, and I always figured I'd like to save somebody's life sometime and be a hero. But when I saw him go down again, I just didn't move a muscle. Even if I did hear a voice in my head, plain as day, saying, He's going to drown. One of the oars was lost and floating around near Silas, but he didn't see it or didn't have the sense enough to grab it. Get get grab it. it. Grab get the oar, Silas. We paddled with the other oar and with our hands trying to get to him, but the boat was heavy and we didn't make it. We just sat there looking at the place a minute. He's drowned. <laughs> The Tupper kid began to cry. We got the other oar and started back to shore. That was all we could do. And while we rode in, we could hear Mrs. Nab's voice screaming, Silas! Silas! We didn't look at her as we rode in. By the time we got there, she had fainted, and they had dragged her up from the shore piece, and the ladies were working on her. But there was Mr. Nab, and the other men standing there around him on the shore, watching us come. One of the men walked out in the water toward us. Boys, get out of that boat. We got out, and the men climbed in. Mr. Nab, too. Then one of the men said to me, Get your pants and shirt off. Get in here. And I did, though just for a minute I couldn't think what for. Then I knew I was going to have to dive for that body. That man knew I could swim and dive pretty good. So we rode back out to the place, as near as we could tell, Mr. Nab sitting on a seat in a boat, gone mighty white in the face and not saying anything and not crying. One of the men said, If we get him up right quick and maybe there's some breath in him. But Mr. Nab said, No, it's God's will. When we got out there, one of the men said, This the place? I said, I reckon so. All right. He didn't say for me to dive. He just said, all right. So I stood up, feeling the sun hit me on the back of my neck and between my shoulder blades and got ready to dive. I didn't look at Mr. Nab. The men held the oars in the water to steady the boat, and I dived. I was so nervous of something. I, I didn't get a good breath before I hit the water, and so I didn't get to bottom before I had to come up. One of the men helped me climb into the boat. None of them said a word, just sitting there in the sun. The next time I got bottom, I went down fast swimming, breaststroke down, and I felt my hand touch bottom, for it was so deep it was dark. The bottom of a pond is the softest place in the world, and dark deep down. Not water and not mud, just like velvet in the dark, only softer. And when my hand touched bottom that time, just for a split second, I thought how nice it would be to lie there. It was so soft, and look up, trying to see where the light made the water green. Then I got scared, and I swam for the top and popped out of the water with my ears roaring and the light sudden like an explosion. I kept on diving. I likely dived near 50 times, I guess, and I got bottom a lot of times. One time I touched the body on the face, and I made a grab for something to hold to, but I missed, and I couldn't see in the dark. When I touched that face, I felt like screaming, but you can't scream under the water but once. When I missed, I came back on up. After a while, I got so tired out, I couldn't get in the boat hardly. The last time, they had to pull me in, and I couldn't move. I said I'd dive again in a minute, but Mr. Nab said, No, and thank you, son. They rowed back in and took me out of the boat. Somebody had telephoned town, and some big boys and men had come on out to get the body. A young fellow named Spooner dived down and got it. He got it on his third try, but that was just luck to get it so soon. I was sick at my stomach, and my head was about to pop open from diving so much. In a way, I was glad I didn't get the body, for if I had been the one to get it up, Mr. Nab might have thought I was good enough to save Silas when he fell in. It was mighty hard on Mr. and Mrs. Nab having a tragedy like that in a family, I reckon. In some ways, I reckon it is worse to have a nitwit die on your hands than somebody with good sense because you feel more responsible. But some people said it was a blessing in the long run, Silas being afflicted like he was. And the Nabs had Alec, who wasn't but about three years old then. Alec turned out to have good sense, all right. And they never tried to teach him about turning the other cheek like they did Silas. Somebody must have told him how the boys imposed on Silas because Silas never hit back. Alec turned out to be a terror. 
He wasn't very big, taken after his father, but he was a terror. He wouldn't take anything off nobody, and he always had a chip on his shoulder. The older he got, the worse he got that way. And he kept fast company, too. When he was about 22, he got in a row and shot a man with a 38. The man died. Alec is over in Nashville in the pen now, and I guess he'll be there a good long time. We've been listening to A Christian Education by Robert Penn Warren with Janice Duclos, Fred Sullivan Jr., Stephen Thorne, and our former host, Bob C. We're going to take a short break and return for a conversation. This is Trinity Rep Radio Theater. Stay with us. You're listening to Trinity Rep Radio Theater on WRNI. Recorded live in WRNI studios and broadcasting the first full weekend of each month, actors from Trinity Repertory Company perform and discuss short stories, poetry, personal narratives, and excerpts from novels with Trinity Rep's artistic director, Kurt Columbus. If you would like to learn more about this program, we invite you to visit our website at wrni.org. You can hear past programs online, or you can subscribe to the Trinity Rep Radio Theater Podcast. It's all online at wrni.org. We're back with Trinity Rep Radio Theater. I'm Kirk Columbus with Janice Duclos. And before the break, we heard one of our favorite stories, a 2007 recording of A Christian Education by Robert Penn Warren starring Janice Duclos, Fred Sullivan Jr., Steve Thorne, and our former host and beloved friend, Bob C., in a beautiful cameo. So beautiful. And a wonderful job by you, too, Chris Columbus. (laughs) Yes, I guess I'm in there, too, as one of the nasty kids. (laughs) That that really is one of our favorite stories that we've ever done, isn't it? It really is. I, I just love the way Robert Penn Warren writes through this guy and lets this guy discover his own journey. He's yeah. not, he doesn't listen to his conscience. Right. And when it glimmers of it step in, then he resolves himself of the responsibility. Yeah. Just steps back. Steps back. It, it's, it's funny because Penn Warren is such an extraordinary writer. He moves from comedy to tragedy almost instantaneously, <laughs> right? One minute you're laughing about the little kid pulling me, Silas, what does God say? <laughs> and just that construction, Silas, what does God say? is like an echo of a 19th century story, but it's used for comic effect. It has all of these questions about God and what is good and goodness built into it. I mean, it's an extraordinary construction. Yes, he's an absolutely fabulous writer. I mean, there's so many phrases in there that I oh. <laughs> that I can't even remember them all. One of them is like, <laughs> when he's under the water going for the body, oh. and he wanted to scream, and he says... You can't scream but once under the water. Yeah, and that description in the bottom of the pond. And anyone who's ever dived into a pond knows what that feeling is. It's the softest place in the world. And there is a part of you that thinks, how peaceful is it? You know, I mean, it's just, oh, God, and that Stephen Thorne, that performance is so extraordinary because he gives us all of that moral ambiguity and complexity without making judgment on either side. Yeah, I mean, he... I think he sees it, but he makes excuses for it. And, and I find that really fascinating and human. Yeah. Yeah. Human. Right. It's, it's, the, it's the fact that Penn Warren allows us to look at human beings and come to our own conclusions instead of judging them himself. It's, it's really quite extraordinary. Why don't we read a couple more from Reader's Right to kick off this section of our program? Yes. We have three more narratives um, concerning turning points and lasting legacies. And in these cases how the arts can change lives. All right, and we'll start with you, Kurt, and a man's memory of a gift from his father. I was a bored 15-year-old in 1959 when my dad brought home a spinet piano as a surprise. None of us played, and the piano barely fit in our small living room. The treble end of the keyboard extended partly into the kitchen. For several months, it sat there like a mute stranger while my brother, my sister, my mother, and I tried to figure out what to do with it. What had Dad been thinking? Having played the saxophone, 
badly since fourth grade, I knew how to read music. Once I'd found middle C on the keyboard, it was actually easy to locate the other notes. I began playing whole and half notes using just two fingers, then moved on to quarter notes and four fingers. Finally, I was using all ten digits at once. My parents were pleased, and I loved the attention that playing brought me. I learned everyone's favorite songs. Dad liked them loud and fast. Dark Town Strutter's Ball, Alexander's Ragtime Band, and his favorite to sing loud and off-key was When You Wore a Tulip. (laughs) Dad sometimes worked 14-hour days at the grocery he owned, which left little time for any of us to get to know him. His passions were football and baseball, and despite my complete inability to throw or catch, he and I tossed a football one summer afternoon in our backyard, ringed by the hundreds of petunias he had planted each year. I still appreciate how he overlooked my ineptitude. As an adult, I bought a spinet piano and began practicing many hours a week, mostly classical music. After a couple of decades, I could rip into Bach's solfeggetto in C minor with its many 16th notes at 100 beats per minute. But my all-time favorite was, and is, Richard Adensel's Warsaw Concerto, with its heart-wrenching, romantic theme, its exciting runs, and attention-getting double and triple fortes. I played it for my father on his 80th birthday, on my sister's baby grand. At the last note, I looked up and saw he had tears in his eyes. So did I. When my father died at age 91, we gathered in the snow around his grave and loudly sang, When You Wore a Tulip. Now I'm 66 and can no longer play for hours. On a good day, I can muster 15 minutes of something soothing, like Debussy's reverie played loose and easy. Though my tempos are slowing, the music is as satisfying and inspiring today as it was when I first discovered it, a half a century ago, my left hand in the living room and my right hand in the kitchen. Bill Stoner In 1969... I was 13 and barely passed my obsession with Nancy Drew mysteries and the monkeys. I had a crush on Davy Jones and practiced kissing his picture in teen magazines. When I met Ricky, a 15-year-old with sideburns and a guitar, he introduced me to rock and roll. I was a shy outcast, a wannabe anything. Ricky was well-informed about anti-war protests, peace and love, and the wonders of psychedelics. He exposed me to Jimi Hendrix, The Who, Jefferson Airplane, and Ravi Shankar. One night, his dad drove us to the movies to see Monterey Pop, a documentary about the 1967 Rock Music Festival. Ricky and I were making out in the dark when a scorching, squealing guitar caught my attention and I looked up at the screen. The spotlight caught a woman's legs in tight, bell-bottomed pants, shaking, jerking, and vibrating with an insistence, an assertion, a sensual power. I had never seen or heard Janis Joplin before. Until that moment... I hadn't known a woman could be that real. The hair flying, the woe all over her face. I'd thought emotions had to be hidden. The unchoreographed gyrations, the throbbing, sultry music. It felt like a rite of passage. This was not Nancy Drew. I didn't go out and start wearing feathers in my hair the next day. It was probably six months before I even had one of Janice's albums. But as I sat there in that theater, I felt soul and passion poke their first cautious shoots up through the dirt of my crippling self-consciousness. I now knew 
there was a way to express pain, love, and sorrow, and that it was okay to be all of yourself, even the darker and more powerful parts. Over the years since, I haven't always lived true to what I learned from Janice, but whenever I'm confronted with life's cruel mysteries or unexpected joys, I still hear her sing, Tra! Just a little bit harder. Karen V. As a child, I had a crippling case of stage fright that no amount of encouragement could cure. In my fourth grade year, a member of the local symphony orchestra came to our classroom to give a demonstration of all the stringed instruments. I overcame my shyness long enough to tell him that the viola made the most beautiful sound I'd ever heard. He replied that the reason I liked it was that my own voice had, quote, the timbre of a viola. I never saw that man again, but from that moment on, my stage fright was cured. Not only that, I went on to sing, debate, and run for every school office. And after graduating, I jumped into the social movements of the 60s, demonstrating, marching, and chanting. After all, I had the timbre of a viola. No doubt everyone loved hearing my voice. Around age 25, I finally heard my voice on tape and was surprised to find it very ordinary, with no distinguished qualities of any sort. But by then, it was too late. I already had the confidence to express myself without fear in any setting. As a youngster, I would have been crushed to learn that the man from the symphony had made the same observation about someone else's voice. Now, I hope there was a child in each classroom he visited to whom he gave the same gift. C.M. Pascal. You're listening to Trinity, Trinity Rep Radio Theater. And that was a lovely reading, Kurt. And, you know, I am so touched by all of these stories. Oh, me too. What an impression the arts and people in the arts make on youngsters every day. Well, and it's, you know, it's funny, Janice, because we're involved in this conversation doing what we do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you hear people say, well, in a, uh, in a world where there are so many other things that we need to pay for, why should we pay for the arts? Mm -hmm. Well, it, and of course, um, and, I, and by doing that funny voice, I'm already suggesting what my opinion is of someone <laughs> who says that to me. But I mean, I, I really, you know... Um, you can't think of arts and culture as something that you taste and then move away from. In fact, arts and culture feeds and nourishes life, development. If we think back to those original stories that we read about the Monopoly game and the, the sister who sang, what if someone had encouraged that girl to sing? What if, she'd, what if she had had that part of herself, which was crushed, squashed, if she had been allowed to let that blossom? Now, it doesn't mean she's going to become a professional singer. Arts education isn't about training people to be artists. It's about training people to be people. And you, you, this is lost so often in the discussion that, that uh, you know, you get this sense that, that people are saying, well, we're just trying to train the next generation of artists. No, we're trying to train people who are civically engaged, awake, empathetic, uh, imaginative, all of those other things and I'm just discovering this as we're talking, but in fact, it's sort of the arc of our stories today is what, what if someone had encouraged those people who were crushed to blossom? And the arts can do that. They can. I really, truly believe that they can. I can't add anything to that, Kurt. That was great. <laughs> yeah, you may, I may have said that one or two times before. I wonder if I... But it's, but it's true. And that's what I love about these readers, writes pieces, readers write pieces, Janice and you brought them to us, is the fact that they're average people expressing themselves so genuinely, so beautifully, so intelligently. And that, that speaks volumes to the necessity for culture in our lives. I'm, I'm now going to move on to uh, let everyone know that with today's show, we're celebrating our fifth anniversary with WRNI, 
We want to thank our listeners, thank our actors, our authors for sharing these five seasons. Uh, But today, after this broadcast, Trinity Rep Radio Theater will begin a production hiatus. We want to send out a couple of special thank yous to Jim Moses, our sound engineer and fantastic editor. And also, last but certainly not least, our fabulous producer, Emily Atkinson, whose resourcefulness and organizing skills and very presence just has helped to make these shows what they are. And without the two of those people who you never hear on the air, um, it's it would have been impossible to do this show. So we have to thank them most of all. Now, our archived programs will remain available for listening at WRNI.org. If you've missed any of the shows in the last five years, there are more than 30. We hope that you'll enjoy them during our hiatus. We're going to end with one last Reader's Right piece about the power of the arts Take it away, Janice Duclos. Two of my three children have ample poise and confidence. They love to ask questions of store clerks and lifeguards and policemen, but my third child, Noah, age nine, still holds my hand whenever we're someplace unfamiliar and finds it difficult to ask a friend's mother for seconds on dessert. But put the two confident ones on stage, however, and they become awkward, hunched-over, squirmy children who would rather be anywhere than in the spotlight. Put Noah up there, and you have a born star. He takes performing seriously, straightening his back and projecting to the far reaches of the auditorium. His two most memorable performances have been as a 104-year-old man who keeps falling asleep in the middle of his monologue and as a leftover potato latke who sings about being unappreciated. I sit in the audience and cry sometimes, watching him bloom. Angelina Citron. You've been listening to Trinity Rep Radio Theater, a production of WRNI and Trinity Repertory Company. Janice Duclos, director. Emily Atkinson and Janice Duclos, producers. Kurt Columbus, executive producer. Jim Moses, sound engineer. Joe O'Connor is WRNI's general manager. This program featured Janice Duclos, Fred Sullivan Jr., and Stephen Thorne with A Christian Education, Copyright, The Estate of Robert Penn Warren, produced by permission of William Morris Agency, LLC, on behalf of the author, published in the collection The Circus in the Attic, 1952, Wants, by Grace Paley, from the 1974 collection Enormous Changes at the Last Minute, and used by permission of Markson Thoma Literary Agency, and pieces from The Sun Magazine's Reader's Right section. You can hear this program again and find all of Trinity Rep Radio Theater's archive programs at WRNI.org. I'm Kurt Columbus. And I'm Janice Duclos. Thank you for listening.